very much, Malcolm. Well, good morning. It's lovely to be with you all again uh, this fine Monday morning. And our talk today is all about Roman Britain. And we're going to be using objects from the British Museum collections, many of which are on public display. When the museum is back open again up in Gallery 49, we have our Roman Britain collection. I'm now just going to move to screen sharing. I'm going to pick up my Roman Britain. PowerPoint, we will begin from the beginning. Always a good place to start. I'm also, as usual, just going to pick up my laser pointer. Lovely. So I now. So Roman Britain life in an imperial Roman province. Now, uh, there's a lot of ongoing debate about Roman Britain. Uh, the facts are not very much in contention, but there is a lot of discussion amongst archeologists about the initial impact and long-term legacy of Roman rule in Britain. What we're going to do today is we're going to be focusing on the introduction of some particular ways of Roman life uh, that arrived in Britain with the Romans. We're also, of course, going to be making some reference to the people of Iron Age Britain who were living in Britain before the arrival of the Romans. And we're going to, at some point, do some comparison between the Roman way of life and continuation of the Iron Age way of life. And we're going to begin by thinking about the Roman Empire itself. And we have here a map of the Roman Empire with lands shown in orange extending all around the Mediterranean Sea. And this shows the greatest extent of the Roman Empire in AD 117 under the Emperor, Emperor Trajan. And at this point, you can see Britain is part of that empire which stretches from modern Western Europe through modern Eastern Europe, round into the Middle East, and then across North Africa. Now, when we talk about Roman Britain, uh, people often think about Britain in the modern sense of the word, where it's usually taken to mean the four nations of the United Kingdom, Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. But when we're talking about Roman Britain, we need to remember that not all of the British Isles became part of the empire, as we can see from the map under the Emperor Trajan. So what happened is that England, which was really the heart of Roman Britain, was conquered over a period of four decades, starting from initial Roman footfall in southern England, from where they then moved north and west. The conquest of Wales began in AD 43, the Romans having landed in England in AD, four, sorry, conquest began in Wales in AD 48, the Romans having landed in England in AD 43, and the invasion and occupation of Wales was completed by AD 78. Now if we turn to Scotland, Modern Scotland was known to the Romans as Caledonia, uh, the name of one of the tribes of people living in lowland Scotland. And Roman legions did arrive in the territory of modern Scotland around AD 71, but it was never held as part of the imperial province. In AD 142, they built what is known as the Antinian Wall across the central belt of Scotland and that stood as the northernmost frontier of the Roman Empire. It took 12 years to complete, but was abandoned only eight years after this completion. And the garrisons relocated back to the more famous northern boundary, which was Hadrian's Wall. There were subsequently a few attempts by the Romans, particularly under the Emperor Septimus Severus, to conquer Scotland. All of them failed, and all the way through to the end of Roman Britain, the northern boundary was in northern England 
at Hadrian's Wall. Now, Ireland was now conquered by the Romans. There is evidence of trading found just north of Dublin, and there was trading between the Roman province of Britannia and the island of Ireland, which continued through into the AD 300s, but Ireland never formed part of the Roman Empire. So Wales, or indeed Western England, were the westernmost part of the Roman Empire. Now this is the Welling, City, Welling Garden City Burial, which is on display in room 50 at the British Museum. It's a late Iron Age burial, and it was found when a gas pipe trench was being dug for a new housing estate in the area. Now, most of the objects in this burial are British, but we can see from the wine in Fora and also the small silver cup, that some of the objects in this burial in Southern England are Italian and the pottery, particularly the flat platters and the large flagons, were made in Roman Gaul, modern day France. The burial itself dates to the late first century BC. So this is before Britain, England had become part of the Roman Empire. And it dates from midway between the expeditions of Julius Caesar who came over to Britain in 55 and 54 BC from his base in Gaul, and the eventual invasion of the Emperor Claudius in AD 43. So for about a hundred years, between Julius Caesar's expeditions and the invasion of the Emperor Claudius, certainly Southern England could be seen as part of the sphere of influence of the Roman Empire, which at that point lay just across the channel in modern France. And archaeologists think that objects such as the silver cup may well have been diplomatic gifts given by the Romans as they tried to build up local alliances in southern England. The amphora themselves also demonstrate that rulers in southern England, which at that point was organised on a tribal basis where you had local kingdoms ruled by kings and queens across England, Wales and indeed up into Scotland, that some of these leaders were starting to adopt a Roman way of life and they were enjoying imports such as Roman wine being shipped across from Gaul. Now, another piece of archaeology we have from this period is the Winchester Hoard. And here we see the Winchester Hoard on display again in room 50 at the British Museum, which again gives you a clue that what we're looking at here is something from Iron Age Britain rather than Roman Britain. Now, the hoard consists of two sets of gold jewellery and it has an extremely high gold content. We're looking at a gold content here of 91 to 99%. Gold is a very soft metal, so it's usually mixed with another metal, often silver, to make a more durable alloy. Now, this set of jewellery dates from 75 to 25 BC. So again, we're sitting in that 100 year period when England was starting to become a sphere of influence for the Roman Empire. And although the objects look very Iron Age in style, and if any of you know objects such as the Snettersham Talk, which was an Iron Age votive deposit buried in modern East Anglia, you'll see a similarity in the style of jewellery and also the way in which we think they were worn reflects the style of clothing in late Iron Age Britain. No zips, no buttons, so in fact brooches and what to us look like a necklace are being used as clothing fasteners. Despite this, the techniques used to make these items of jewellery tell us that they are Roman made. 
they were not made in England. And we think that they were possibly a gift from Romans to try and win friends and influence people and try and ingratiate themselves with pro-Roman tribal kings who could then be used as client rulers to maintain peace on the edge of the empire and who then ultimately could be looked upon to support an invasion. Interestingly, there's a very similar situation occurs in ancient Egypt, where the last pharaoh, Cleopatra VII, begins, uh, begins as an ally of the Roman rulers, um, involved with both Julius Caesar and later Mark Antony. And Egypt, the latter part of her reign, is operating as a client kingdom in a similar way before it's ultimately invaded and becomes part of the Roman Empire. When Claudius's troops came across, they landed in southern England and this formed the base of their military occup occupation for the next four decades as they worked north and west. And here we have the head of a statue of Claudius found in Suffolk. It dates to the invasion period, and we know that life-size imperial statues were placed in important public and official spaces. And it's possible, uh, not known for certain, but possible that it would have stood in a Roman settlement such as the Roman settlement built at Colchester. The tile, which we see next to it, was found in Wales, dates from the 2nd to 3rd century AD, and this object would have been a row of ornate tiles set along a tiled roof, and we can see that it was made in the tilery of the Roman army's 20th XX, Roman for 20, legion, L-E-G, whose emblem was a wild boar. So again, this is telling us about the early and continued presence of the Roman military in this new province. And we'll come back to the role of the military later on. But one suggestion for how this head of Claudius ended up removed from the statue to which it was once attached is that it may, and I emphasize the word may, it may have been removed during the rebellion of Boudicca. And we have evidence, certainly of the aftermath of that rebellion at the British Museum. And we are looking here at the reconstructed tombstone of Gaius Julius Alpinius Classicius. And he was appointed as the financial minister of Britain after the revolt of the Iceni, which was led by Queen Boudicca in AD 60 to 61. So about 20 years after the initial invasion. And his job was to correct the financial abuses, which had been an important cause of the rebellion. Now, this is a very interesting item in our collections, because we know it was set up for the financial minister who arrived after the rebellion. It also tells us that unfortunately he died very soon after his arrival and as was usual in the ancient world the body was buried where he died so he's buried he was buried in Roman London and this tombstone was set up by his wife Julia and you can see here translation of the surviving inscriptions. Now the rebellion of the Iceni is often couched as part of a native rebellion against Roman rule. And to a certain extent it was. But we have to remember that the Iceni had been one of the tribes in southern and eastern England who had allied themselves with the Romans right at the start of Roman rule. And under this alliance, they managed to garner financial advantages for their people and for their territory. And the difficulties arose when Boudicca's husband, Prasutius, died. Because in his will, 
he had left his territory divided equally between his wife and the Roman emperor. Uh, the Romans were not very pleased with this arrangement. They had expected that the whole territory would come to them on his death as a way of closing down his client kingdom and assimilating it into the province. And this was the point when Boudicca and her objection to the Romans taking total control of what she saw as her territory led to the rebellion. Now, we know that as well as this rebellion, where we have a very detailed narrative about the causes and the course and the consequence of the rebellion, which led to the ultimate defeat of Boudicca and her troops north of London, that over the 40 year conquest of England, there was local opposition and military resistance. And archeologists have calculated that over the 40 years of conquest, between 100 and 250 Britons were killed. And in the context of pre-industrial warfare and a British population at the time, which may have been around 3 million, these are very high figures. And this also leads us back to the Roman army who we were talking about earlier. There's been quite a lot of debate about why there was such a high level of military occupation in Roman Britain. And part of it may have been to do with this 40 year period over which territory was gradually conquered. Roman Britain did not become Roman Britain in AD 43. In AD 43, I think it probably might be better to talk about it in terms of Roman, uh, Kent, Sussex and Surrey. It really isn't until later on that we can talk about a complete Roman province seated on the current British Isles. Now the population of Roman Britain, as we've said, is calculated to be about three million. And during the times of the Roman occupation, uh, it's been calculated that there were troops which consisted of 35,000 auxiliary troops and 15,000 troops who were based in the Roman legions, which means altogether with a population of 3 million, the Romans had stationed and garrisoned in Roman Britain 50,000 troops. Now, if we can compare that to modern Britain, where we're looking at a population of roughly 64 million, the number of troops uh, actively employed across or deployed across Britain and on service overseas stands at 91,000. So less than double the number that were here in Roman times. So that gives us an idea of the high level of military personnel stationed in Britain. And another argument is that later on in the history of the Roman Empire, Britain was a convenient outpost on the edge of the empire to station legions, which later on in the imperial story were often used as power bases for various generals and political figures to declare themselves emperor. And we'll come back to that right at the very end of our talk today. So here we see examples of pieces of kit that would have been held by a Roman soldier. Now, kit changed throughout the imperial period, but the basic kit supplied by the army would have been the helmet, the armour and the weaponry. Soldiers themselves, we know, had to supply their undergarment and their socks. Weapons such as the sword were held centrally, Though we know that items such as shield bosses, which is the round circular metal part of a shield, may have been owned by individuals. On the far side of the screen, we can see the brass fittings, which would have been placed and attached onto iron body armour designed to protect the upper torso. The iron itself has disintegrated in the soil, we have just the bronze fittings left, but they give us an idea of the shape and the layout of the strips of iron that would have made up the body armour itself. And here we have two Roman helmets, 
both of them are incomplete, but when we look at them together, we get an idea of the dome at the top, at the top of the head, and often that would have an iron undercap. You then have a neck guard and two cheek pieces on either side to protect the neck and the side of the face from sword blows. On display at the British Museum is a set of objects known as the Ribchester Horde. And again, these give us an idea of the type of kit that would have been held by a Roman soldier stationed in Britain. It comes from a soldier who was part of a cavalry unit. We know this because part of the horde consists of eye shields that would have been worn by Roman cavalry horses. It also contains a parade helmet and parts of the cavalry soldiers everyday kit. We have a mortaria which is a mixing bowl for creating sauces when you are cooking. We also have some small bronze frying pans which might have been used either for cooking at the fort or for pouring libations as part of a religious ceremony. Now the cavalry helmet is particularly interesting because on the cavalry helmet there are a number of loops and also the cavalry helmet is shaped from thin bronze which would not have been much protection against a sword coming in at speed towards your head. And we think if we look across to the reconstruction drawing made by Karen Hughes, who worked in the Department of Prehistory and Roman Britain at the British Museum, that this is how the parade helmet would actually have been used. It would have been worn during military parades one of the things that the Roman army had to keep an eye on with this large number of troops stationed in Britain was that when these soldiers were not engaged in active service, their time needed to be occupied with training, uh, with exercises, manoeuvres in the local area. And in addition, there would have been regular parades, cavalry sporting events, and also mock battles. And we think that the Ribchester helmet would have been worn on the occasion of some of these parades, a bit like the Edinburgh tattoo, and would have been decorated, as we can see here, with trailing ribbons which were tied into those hooks. Now, we've already discussed how the northern barrier of Roman Britain lay for the most on Hadrian's Wall. And here we have a small bronze bowl that would have sat very comfortably in the palm of the hand and on the side of it we have a schematic drawing of Hadrian's wall and originally it would have had picked out part of the wall in coloured enamels but these have not survived. Now the wall was built during the reign of the Emperor Hadrian hence Hadrian's wall and it was a continuous barrier which ran from coast to coast across northern England. And on this bowl, we have the name of a number of forts along Hadrian's Wall, one of which we see above, which stood at modern day Bowness on Sol Bur sorry, stood at modern day Burr by Sands. And if we look opposite, we have a figurine of a Roman auxiliary cavalry soldier who may well have been based at this Roman fort around AD 200 to 400. Uh, his horse is missing. He wears a cloak, a tunic and boots and holds his shield at an angle across what would have been the back of his horse. And he is from a North African unit who was stationed on Hadrian's Wall at the western end and were probably brought over by the Emperor Septimus Severus, who was himself of North African heritage. So this would have been one of the soldiers stationed on Hadrian's Wall uh, at the northernmost point of Roman Britain. 
Britain was a destination for the Romans, not only in a political sense, uh, because it provided uh, stable influence on the edge of the empire to the west, but because of the resources that were available in Roman Britain, particularly from late Iron Age times, when the Romans, in their various expeditions and their visits to late Iron Age Britain, were aware of the great wealth of natural resources and agricultural produce which was available uh, in Iron Age Britain. Now, in return, the Romans brought into Roman Britain a number of unique techniques and materials such as the ones we see here on the screen. And the one at the top is a small Ro Roman glass bowl. Uh, it's blue with white marbling running through it. It was found in Oxfordshire. And we know that in Roman Britain, glass was imported from Eastern areas of the empire. So probably this bowl had been traded across the empire from modern day Syria in the Middle East. The Romans also introduced a technique for making pottery, which we know as Samian ware. This piece was found at Felixstowe in Suffolk and was actually manufactured in Roman Gaul. And it was a technique of wheel thrown pottery with a slip glaze and molded decorations, which in its day was seen as the finest tableware that you could have on your table as opposed to the courseware pottery, which would have been used for storing food and cooking food. We also have a lead ingot. Now this lead ingot loops back to what we were just saying about Britain being rich in resources, which was one thing the Romans had their eye on when they made it part of the empire. It's a lead ingot found in modern day Staffordshire and lead was widely used in the Roman Empire. It was used to make alloys such as bronze and pewter, and it was used for waterproofing and piping. Until the second century AD, lead production was often under the control of the emperor. Hence, this lead ingot is stamped with the name, when it, the name of the emperor who was ruling at the time when it was manufactured and exported from Britain back to the mainland part of the empire. And these titles date it to AD 76. We also can see the name of the Celtic tribe in whose land in northeast Wales the lead was quarried and the ingot itself was found on the line of the Roman road known as Wattling Street and may well have fallen off a wagon which was traveling from Wales down towards Southeast England for export. With the cold, wet British soil, Roman Britain is very often represented in museum collections with materials best able to survive those wet cold conditions. So not many organic materials such as food stuff, fabric, textiles, leather survives. But here we have a few examples of organic material which give us a little insight into what the Roman lifestyle in Roman Britain would have looked like for an incoming Roman citizen or a member of Iron Age society who was aping and taking on board this Roman lifestyle. First of all, we have a little bone hairpin. And what I particularly like about this is that the bone hairpin, which was found in London, actually has its own hairstyle on top. So it gives us a little idea of the type of robe, the draping tunics worn by Roman women, and then the elaborate hairstyles, which often included additional hair pieces worn by high status Roman women and seen on some of the Roman coins in the hairstyles of Roman empresses. 
We also have some shoes. We have some leather shoes found in Kent. And we also have some sandals, some Roman sandals found in London. Originally, they would have been laced. The lace has not survived. But underneath, we can see where the hobnails have been driven into the sole of the leather sandal to make them long lasting and to give some traction on the bottom of the leather sole. Leather itself being quite slippery, the hobnails then providing some traction when you're walking. We also have a small piece of a Vindolanda tablet, a set of tablets found up on one of the forts just south of Hadrian's Wall. And this particular Vindolanda tablet mentions a gift which has been sent to one of the soldiers based at Vindolanda Roman Fort. And this is a gift of two socks, underpants and some sandals. And this is part of the evidence for why we think that particular parts of the military kit had to be supplied by the Roman soldiers themselves. And it appears that this soldier has been sent from home, probably by family, um, two pairs of socks, some underpants and a set of sandals. Now, evidence for Roman food again is hard to track in the archaeological record because food as an organic substance does not survive well. We do have evidence of food from animal bones and using techniques such as flotation and sieving on excavation sites has also recently provided evidence in the form of plant seeds and pollen evidence. And also scientists at the British Museum have been analysing the insides of Roman pots to look at where food remains might have remained, might have adhered to the insides of these Roman pots, particularly if they had been in a heat situation. So cooking pots often have burnt remains of food, both on the inside and the outside of the pot. What we can see here are two pieces of Roman cookware, one of which to the left tells us about a new way of cooking which was introduced to Roman Britain. And here we have a gridiron. Now in late Iron Age Britain, a lot of cookery was done in large cauldrons suspended over a fire and would consist of what nowadays we would call porridges, soups and stews. The Romans brought with them uh, a type of cooking which nowadays we would call roasting or perhaps barbecuing, whereby the pan sat on an iron grill which stood above a heat source, usually that heat source being charcoal. This is a particularly ornate cooking grid and is similar to those found in kitchens in Pompeii and Herculaneum. On the other side, we have a pottery cheese press and cheese was one of the foodstuffs that we knew, uh, we know was extant in Iron Age Britain. So a continuation of a type of processing of dairy uh, so that it's, it is uh, available longer term. So you're changing it from milk, which is quite perishable, into cheese, which will then survive longer, particularly if you're creating a hard cheese. And this cheese press was found in Kent and we can see that the holes both at the bottom and the side made it useful for expelling excess whey and it also insist, assisted in pressing the milk curds down to create the fresh and then semi-hard through to hard cheese which could be stored and eaten at a later date. So having had a quick look at a couple of examples of Roman foodstuffs and also thinking about the fact that when we think about food in Roman Britain, we're looking at a continuation of some foodstuffs. So Iron Age Britain, we certainly have evidence of bread, of uh, fruits such as wild apples being eaten, of uh, fruits such as wild nuts being eaten. Uh, we also know that there's the hunting um, of animals, so we have the consumption of meat. Uh, we know that animals are being kept on Iron Age farms, so we have dairy processing. Uh, we also know that the Romans introduced a number 
of food. So the Romans were responsible for introducing cultivated fruits such as cherry and grapes. Uh, they probably also introduced rabbits, uh, a Spanish variety as a farmyard animal. Uh, they brought over with them the wine as we saw in the amphora from the Iron Age burial. They introduced olive oil, uh, pepper, figs. They also introduced a wide range of herbs which were native to the Mediterranean world, uh, which we now take as part of our modern cookery palette, such as sage and thyme, basil and rosemary. So with Roman and Iron Age food in mind, we are now going to take a 10 minute break and I will see you back here in 10 minutes time when we will continue to explore Roman Britain and we're going to start by looking at writing in Roman Britain. See you in a moment. Thank you, Catherine. As she says, it, we'll, we'll take a 10 minute break. So it's 11.40 now. So I will, we will see you back at 11.50. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your 10 minute break. Um, I can see we've, we've got a question for Catherine, which I'll ask her at the end. Uh, but without further ado, let me hand back over to Catherine. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, we are now going to restart. So I'm just going to wake my PowerPoint up. There we go, lovely. And as I said immediately before the break, we're going to start now looking in the second half of our talk at Roman writing. And what we have here on the screen are a selection of objects from the British Museum displayed in Gallery 49. And we have a set of objects ranging from the very small to the larger. And the very small consist of a set of writing equipment, including an inkwell inscribed with the owner's name, which was found at Cannon Street in London, a selection of writing stylus, some of them with dipping nips, nibs, others with flat ends, which would have been used on writing tablets, such as these wooden cases, which were then filled inside with beeswax, which could be written on and then rubbed smooth. So they were reusable, a bit like a Roman post-it note. You could write on them again and again and again. Now, we know that when the Romans arrived in Iron Age Britain, there was an existing Celtic language and it existed as a spoken language only. It was not written down. We have a few examples of that Celtic language which have survived into modern times. For example, the words coom for a valley, as in Kingston coom, and the word tor for a hill are both believed to be of Celtic origin. And we have a few examples of where that Celtic language survives on coins but it has been transliterated into Latin. So they've used the sounds of the Latin letters to spell out the spoken Celtic language. Now, not everyone across the Roman Empire spoke Latin. The Roman Empire itself consisted of over 65 million inhabitants. And whilst Latin was the language of the army and the Roman law, there would have been a variety of local languages spoken across the whole empire. What Latin did was it operated as a gateway language, which allowed everyone in the empire to interact with the Roman infrastructure. Therefore, many peoples would have spoken their native language as well as some Latin. So throughout Roman Britain, the Celtic language would have continued to be used. And in addition, people from other areas of the empire would have brought their own language to the province. And examples of these other languages have been found on altars, tombstones, and in personal, personal correspondence. The Roman elite themselves would probably have been bilingual in both Latin and ancient Greek. Ancient Greek was used in the east of the empire as a primary language, and it was also considered a badge of status, uh, similar to the way that 
European aristocrats in the 18th and 19th century would speak French as the status language. So here we have on the right, a sandstone altar dedicated to Heracles. And this altar came from Corbridge in Northumberland. So it's associated with a Roman military fort and it has been set up in honour of the Greek god Heracles, which became the Roman god Hercules. And we can see transcribed the inscription itself, which is written, carved into the stone in ancient Greek. So an example of where presumably someone serving in the Roman army as a member of auxiliary troop would have been stationed in Roman Britain and has brought with them one of their languages, either a first language or an additional language, ancient Greek, which they then use when setting up a personal inscription to the gods. The other thing that we all know Romans introduced to Roman Britain was the villa. When people talk about Roman villas, uh, they're usually referring to a place where they believed all Romans would have lived. And we certainly have some excellent examples of surviving Roman villas across Roman Britain. And we have here some pieces from Roman villas, which tell us a little bit about the lifestyle that would have taken place in those villas. So here on the left, we have a ceramic tile box flue. You can see it's hollow and it would have been part of a central heating system in a Roman villa. And it would have been one of the box tiles up the wall, which enabled hot air generated below the floor by a furnace to circulate not only underneath the floor but up the walls as well and underneath these bricks or tile pillars which held up the floor and made an artificial space for the hot air to circulate as we can see here still with some of the mortar that would have been between each of the tiles uh, attached to the bottom. And we know that in Britain there was a boom in villa construction after about AD 200 and a lot of the surviving villas which are looked after by the National Trust say up in Gloucestershire such as Chedworth Roman Villa date from this time. Some villas were indeed high status households. We have the example of Fishbourne Palace in Sussex which was built in about AD 75 and we think was probably built by a Celtic client king in the area who was adopting the Roman lifestyle. We also know that there would have been large high status housing complexes in cities such as London, where the governor of the province of Rome would have been stationed. A lot of villas though, particularly out in the countryside, were not so much high status houses as the centres of farming estates. And a lot of the smaller villas that we find are actually a farmhouse for a large farming estate, which would have provided the food for the Roman towns and forts, which acted as consumers who needed to be fed. Many people in Roman Britain would have continued to live in the Iron Age roundhouse, a structure made from local resources, timber, straw, mud, animal dung. And these roundhouses are often found on archaeological sites in association with villas, either because the villa was built where a roundhouse had once stood, so you have continuity of settlement site, or where you have roundhouses continuing to stand during the Roman period alongside a later Roman villa. Now some of the high status villas and housing in some of the major towns and cities would have had for a floor 
a mosaic. And Roman mosaics uh, were something that were copied from the Greeks. We know that the earliest mosaics date from about the second century BC. So were being used in the Roman Empire before Britain became part of that empire and then were brought over to Britain as an established way of flooring your elite rooms. Now, mosaics were very expensive, they were very labour intensive, and therefore even in a high status villa, they were probably only used in the major rooms where they would have been seen by the greatest number of people, particularly guests. And we have here some examples from the British Museum of a variety of mosaics which would have been used in different shapes and styles of room. Now, to begin with, at the bottom, we have a small square mosaic, and this was found on the site of the Bank of England in London. And it's thought that it probably is a whole mosaic which would have floored a small square room. And it dates to the second half of Roman Britain, it's to about AD 300 to 400 and it's decorated with a very ornate geometric pattern. Above it we have another mosaic again found in London from Leadenhall Street but this time we have only the centre of the mosaic which has survived. Around the outside there would have been a larger planar pavement with this round or sitting at the centre and it shows the Roman god Bacchus riding on his leopard and these central roundels were often the most expensive part of a mosaic pavement and we know that sometimes they were actually made not on site but were built up on sand trays in a specialist workshop and then transported to be laid at the villa with the surrounding pavement then added in situ. And so valuable were these central pieces that they were often removed and reused elsewhere and could be handed down from generation to generation within a family. Interestingly enough, uh, this is also how they're often viewed by archaeologists and particularly in Victorian times, when Roman sites were dug, it was often the central roundel of the mosaic which would be lifted and taken to the museum, hence the arrival of this roundel in Victorian times at the British Museum. And if you go into room 49, when the museum reopens, you'll see this on display, we have a roundel from the Hinton St Mary pavement mosaic, mosaic we own all of the mosaic, but again, it's just the central round all that is on display. We have, however, an example of what a larger pavement mosaic might have looked like. This is a set of fragments from a mosaic pavement, and this is one panel which shows the Roman god of the ocean. It may be Neptune, but it's more likely to be god, the god Oceanus. He is shown in the centre with a rather magnificent seaweed beard. He has a crab's legs in his hair. He is holding a trident and is surrounded by sea creatures, including dolphins and possibly my favourite up here, a spotted creature known as a sea leopard. And examples of Roman mosaics such as this are found in the reception rooms of Roman villas. And lesser rooms such as kitchen spaces may well have had tiled floors, but they would have been more likely to have been a uniform terracotta colour, such as the edge of the square mosaic on the left of the screen. Uh, Roman expansion into Britain also saw the expansion of the existing British pantheon of deities. Wherever the Romans went, they took their gods with them. And wherever the Romans went, they also incorporated 
existing deities into their pantheon. An example of this, <clears throat> we can find at Bath. At Bath, the goddess who is worshipped at the Roman Baths is a goddess known as Sulis Minerva. Sulis is the name of an existing Celtic goddess who is then twinned with the Roman goddess Minerva, herself borrowed from the Greek goddess Athena, to create a hybrid goddess, Sulis Minerva. We also have here examples of the type of priestly regalia that would have been worn by religious practitioners in Roman Britain. The difference between late Celtic and Roman Britain was the establishment of sacred places around buildings. In Celtic times, sacred places were out in the countryside. They were often water, um, lakes, rivers, springs, hence the building of a Roman temple over the Bath Spring. And these temples then became the centre of worship for particular Roman gods and goddesses. When the Romans arrived in Britain, uh, the one example of opposition to existing Roman practice we know of is their opposition to the Druids, particularly the base for the Druids in Anglesey, Anglesey in Wales. And we think that this may possibly, as is often said, be because of the practice of human sacrifice by the Druids, but to be honest, is more likely to have had a socio-political uh, opposition uh, because the Druids with their prophecies were leaders, had a lot of social control amongst the Celtic tribes and a lot of therefore political control, which they could use to garner opposition to Roman rule. And this may well have been why the Romans were so keen to suppress them as a religious practice to also then dampen down their social and their political power. We see some small votive plaques which would have been in one of these small Roman temples built across the British countryside. They would have been hung on the wall. We can see some of them still have a small hole in them where a nail was driven through to attach them to the wall of the temple and one of them still has part of the god to which it was dedicated, the Roman god Mars, and these were gifts to the gods, uh, small precious items which a pilgrim to the temple would have purchased and then given to the god or goddess um, in the hope of that god and goddess then looking after them and being on their side, so to speak. Uh, Roman religion, a lot of the practice was based around ensuring that the Roman gods and goddesses were happy and therefore your world would be stable and prosperous. We also have an example of a small message sent to one of these gods. This is a curse tablet found at the Roman temple to Mercury in Gloucestershire and this gives us a little insight into that relationship between worshippers and their gods and goddesses, because this is a small sheet of lead, which originally would have been folded up. We can still see the fold marks from when it was opened up, when it arrived at the museum. And the text on this is inscribed by a visitor, a pilgrim to the temple, who is asking Mercury to help to recover some lost property. And in fact, this curse tablet is asking Mercury to help exact re revenge for the pilgrim for some gloves which have been stolen. And it is believed that this is one of the few examples of evidence for gloves in Roman Britain, uh, because again, being an organic piece of clothing, none have survived in the archeological record but the naming of gloves survives in this curse tablet. Roman deities, which were introduced to Roman Britain, include the Pantheon, who had temples uh, built to them, the gods such as Mercury and Mars and Minerva. 
Also in Roman Britain, there would have been local household gods. And here we have a small copper figure of a Lars Familius. Now, in Latin, these deities were known as family guardians. And they were set up in small household shrines, often set near the hearth of the house. And the tradition was that if you honoured and presented offerings to your family guardian, they in turn would look after your household and your family. If you weren't to neglect your family guardian, they would turn their back and bad fortune would come to your household. We also find that small devotional objects were used about the body as well as in temples and household shrines. So here we have an example of a hairpin which is carved at the top with the goddess Fortuna. So this is like a good luck amulet, a lucky charm that you wear about your person to bring you good fortune. And similarly, we have a ring which is part of the Thetford hoard dating to the AD 300s. And this is engraved, the bezel is a gem engraved with a figure of the god Mars. So you could carry your devotion to the god around with you on your person. The next set of objects speak to a religion which arrived in Britain which was completely new to everyone in the Roman province of Britannia. And this was the arrival of Christianity. And we have evidence for the practice of Christianity in Britain from a selection of objects. The first one here on the far left is again a small fingering. But this time, instead of a Roman god, we find that the bezel of the ring is giving us evidence of the practice of Christianity in Britain. And in particular, the Cairo symbol. And the Cairo symbol to us looks like the letters P and X sitting one atop the other. On this ring, they are backwards because this ring would have been used as a sealing ring for sealing wax on communication. And also on the ring, we have a branch and a bird. Again, two symbols of early Christianity. So we think that this ring may have belonged to an early Christian worshipper in Roman Britain. It dates from the 300s and was found in Essex. And that really fits with the chronology of the journey of the Christian faith from the Eastern Empire, where there were large centers of Christian worship in places such as Antioch and Alexandria around AD 200, and it then being carried into the Western Empire and arriving on the edge of the empire in Britain with a growing congregation in the 300s. And we have examples of this congregation from objects found in Cambridgeshire known as the Water Newton Hoard. And this is part of the Water Newton Hoard. It's a small silver bowl, again dating from the AD 300s. And inscribed around the rim, we have not only a very beautiful Cairo, and Cairo is the first two letters of Christ's name in the ancient Greek alphabet. So the P, and the X to R-I are the Cairo, first two letters of Christ's name. And then we also see an association with the Cairo, two more Christian, another Christian symbol, which is the Alpha to Omega. And that Alpha to Omega is also inscribed with another Cairo on the object to the left, which is a large lead tank, which some people have interpreted as being um, a fault from a site of early Christian worship, but is actually more likely to have been a water storage unit from a site which was probably associated with an early church and an early Christian community because of the inscriptions on the tank. And the Alpha to Omega 
Again, comes from the ancient Greek alphabet, the first and the last letter. And it comes from the idea recorded in the Gospels and the Book of Revelation of God being there at the beginning, Alpha, and also there at the end, Omega. And what's particularly interesting about the tank is that if you look carefully, you'll see that whoever created the tank and inscribed the Alpha to Omega has inscribed them the wrong way around. The A to RI should be first, and then the uppercase Omega, which was rendered to RI in what looks like W, has been put first. So it's probable that although this was used by a Christian community, the object itself was created by someone who was unfamiliar with the symbolism of this relatively new religion. Also, the bowl is inscribed with the name of two people who we think may have been members of one of these early Christian communities because it is inscribed with the phrase Innocentia and Viventa give this offering to Christ. So we think that this silver bowl may have been donated to the church by two female members of the congregation. The end of Roman Britain was a very gradual process. We've just been talking about the AD 300s and traditionally Roman Britain is said to have ended in AD 410. Nowadays in the Roman gallery you'll see that we've amended that figure to 411 but in fact the end of Roman Britain really started back in the late AD 300s when the Roman commander Magnus Maximus who we see here on a coin which he had minted for himself declared himself emperor that idea of an overmighty general who uses his troops to elevate his position. He declared himself emperor and then took troops from Britain across to Gaul, hoping to dethrone the sitting emperor in the West, Gratian. Maximus took a large part of the Roman garrison out of Britain, across to the continent, where he was initially successful in seizing the Western imperial throne, hence the striking of coins in his name as emperor, although he was later defeated by the emperor Theodorus, not all of the troops returned to Britain on his defeat. So we can see that in the 380s we already have a start of a decline of influence, of power, of infrastructure, of military control in the province of Britain. This was then exacerbated when we get into the early 400s and again another Roman general, Constantine, based in Britain, declared himself emperor of the Western Roman Empire. He declared himself emperor in 407 and once again took the troops, the remaining Roman troops, across to Gaul to confront the sitting Western Roman Emperor. Now around this time, Saxon pirates were raiding Britain, Britain which Constantine had left undefended, and upset that Constantine had neglected them in his efforts to declare himself Emperor and establish himself on the imperial throne in Gaul, the Roman inhabitants of Britain rebelled and expelled his officials. So again, a de-escalation, uh, a closing down of the Roman infrastructure operating across Britain. Now, Constantine's bid for power ultimately failed. Uh, he was executed. And in 411, the sitting Roman emperor, Honorus, became once more the Emperor of Britain, probably expected to regain control of Britain, but actually never returned Roman troops to the province. Hence, 
AD 411 is now taken as the end of the official military and political occupation of Britain. And certainly by the mid 500s, the Roman imperial forces in the Western Empire recognized that Britannia was lost. So after 400 years of Roman rule, Britain still continued. Certainly we think for the first 50 years to follow a lot of the political, social and economic systems which had been set up during 400 years of imperial rule. rule. But this marks the point where Roman Britain starts to transition into the next big period of British history, Anglo-Saxon England. So thank you very much for joining me this morning to find out a little bit about Roman Britain. Um, I am now more than happy to take some questions. If there are any particular objects you'd like me to chat about a bit more or any aspects of Roman Britain we haven't yet covered, um, I'm all yours. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Catherine. Um, just before I ask Catherine some, some of your questions, and I've got those lined up, I've got seen those, seen those on the q and I've just got a quick poll for us to do at, at the end. Let's get this. I'll launch that poll now. If you can answer those two questions, that would be fantastic. And then I'll put, you put your questions to Catherine. Right, I'm gonna I think most people have voted. I'll just give you I'll just give you fifteen seconds. <laughs> there we count you down. Three, two, one. Thank you very much. Right, so let's start with the questions. Um Claire, in the photo of the sandals, was that a pattern on the leather of one of the pairs? Yes, I think the shoe you were probably referring to were the pair of shoes on the far left, which were a pair of leather shoes that were found in Kent. Um, and to my mind, ra rather lovely uh, fact is that they were found in a place called Soul Field uh, in Kent. They're on the collections online database on the British Museum website, and they're a pair of ladies' shoes. They were recovered from a burial site, from a sarcophagus, hence their good preservation. And they were made from very fine purple leather. And that purple leather was then tooled. If we were talking about stone, we'd talk about inscribed or engraved. It was tooled and cut with a hexagon design. So onto the surface of the leather and actually then through the leather itself, a number of interlocking hexagons were inscribed. And you can see those in lovely detail if you go onto collections online, because there's a number of photos, including close-ups of the shoes. And then within the shoe itself, what looks to us like color coming through those holes is, is then what the person would have worn around their foot inside the shoe. So when you're looking at it, it looks like there's an inner lining. It's actually, I suppose nowadays you talk about it if someone's wearing sandals and socks, you, you can see the socks through the gaps in the sandal. But the sandal itself, the main decoration comes from the colour of the leather, which was purple, and then that cutting and incising the working of the soft leather surface. They, they are beautiful and very rare. Thank you. Um, Jan has, has asked, how could the empire afford such a huge expense, expense of so many troops in every country? Uh, that is a very good question. Keeping a large standing army is very expensive. Uh, and we know that although there would have been what we could call cost site cost-saving exercises such as we know that weapons were held centrally so weapons were issued out to individual soldiers as they came in and out of the army. As a whole that army cost a lot 
to feed and it costs a lot to house. And we know that in the Roman Empire, they had a system of taxation. So there was taxation coming from all the provinces, which then went to the centre, to the heart of the empire, which enabled the imperial government to then fund the infrastructure of the empire itself. And part of that would have been funding the military. We also know that in terms of imperial rule, one of the big drivers for going into new provinces was the fact that provinces would then support the central Roman infrastructure. So we mentioned that in Britain, a Roman fort would be fed and Roman towns would be fed by villa farming estates in the countryside. Uh, the Roman fort itself would also have a small farm area outside the Roman fort where they would grow crops and keep animals. But this could also apply to a whole province. So, for example, when Egypt was taken into the Roman Empire, the, one of the main drivers was the huge amount of grain that could then be exported en masse from Egypt to feed the rest of the empire. So a large standing army, it needs two things. It needs a form of taxation, which allows you just to collect what you could call pure money from across the empire. It also needs manpower which in the Romans case was managed by the legions who were soldiers who were citizens and also by the auxiliary troops who were soldiers drawn from the provinces who were not citizens but signed up to the army and were then stationed around the empire to support imperial rule. That was our little North African cavalryman, he would have been an auxiliary man. And you also then need a way to feed that army and ironically what that means is that the bigger your army becomes the bigger your empire has to become so they almost feed on each other so as your empire gets bigger so your empire needs to consume more and needs to draw in more resources from the provinces so it's it sort of feeds on itself which is ironic because then when you look at the end of Roman Britain of course the withdrawing of the troops from Britain would have actually then meant that more of the produce in Britain would have gone to the sitting community because as the troops go out, therefore they take away that consumption of local resources. Thank you. Um, Adele has asked, uh, where were the main where the main Roman ports? Uh, did, did they use existing ports or did they build their own? And were the ports used for military and trade purposes? Very good question. And I also like the fact that you've married up in that question the idea of military and trade, because it's certainly thought that in early Roman Britain, there was a very close relationship between movement of the military and movement of merchants and trade. Because once the military have set a road down, the early Roman roads were actually built to enable swift movement of the army around a province in which military control had not yet been established. But once you have a road network, merchants can then use that road network to transport goods. There would have been ports in Southern England because we know that in that hundred year period between the expeditions of Julius Caesar and the actual invasion in AD 43, that there was continual trade which had been going on from way back in prehistoric times as goods and people and ideas move from mainland Europe across to the British Isles. So there would have been natural harbours which traders could use for harbouring ships that were coming from Roman Gaul across to Britain. The Romans once they arrived would certainly have sought to embellish these and we know from examples in on the Roman the Italian peninsula itself, that building a strong harbour meant that you had a twin advantage, not only in terms of having somewhere that you could land your military troops, but also somewhere that you then had docks where you could build warehouses to facilitate trade and the economy. So early harbours would have been what we nowadays call natural harbours. Um, 
ironically enough, plates, small modern harbours such as Foy down in Cornwall are natural harbours. They have a they have a deep enough base to the seabed that ships can sail in right to the land. Um, and then these would have been improved by the Romans who would have then set wharfs in. And we know they do this in London along the River Thames. They set in timber wharfs on the river bank or on the coast, which then enable larger ships who then can't get into the shallower water to dock further out on the wharf. So from a natural harbour, you then build out your wharfs, which then enable larger and larger shipping to dock. So again, it's almost like that idea that we, we were discussing with the military of a harbour almost feeds on itself. So once you have a harbour established for small boats, then you start to build your wharfs, which means you can then handle larger boats. And once you can handle larger boats, you get greater trade running through the port and the port starts to become more and more important. But if that trade goes, it's the loss of the trade more than the loss of the military, which would lead to, lead to a decline in the port, uh, plus any natural um, situations such as silting up of the port, which is what we know has happened in Sussex uh, with a lot of the ports such as Rye are now inland because there's been natural silting up. But yes, military and trade often were symbiotic and certainly trade made a lot of use uh, of early military infrastructure to support their, their economic activity. Patricia has asked, uh, what was the size of the roundel mosaic that we saw? In fact, if you know the other, the other, the other mosaics size, that'd be quite interesting as well, actually. Uh, yes. Now, uh, if you are looking at a roundel, if it is a very elaborate roundel, such as the one with Bacchus, then you are looking at something which could be built off site in all probability. And we know that you can get roundels of between half a metre and a metre, which in diameter, which were built off site on a sand tray and then carried to the building for laying. Uh, the Leadenhall roundel is up on the wall and, at the British Museum and it's just over a metre in diameter. So it's actually, it's very large and it would originally have been surrounded by what we then call the wider mosaic pavement which would have been built to fit the room. So the size of the mosaic, if the mosaic is complete, tells you the size of the room. It's like a fitted carpet. So the one that we saw with Oceanus on it, uh, that was only one panel from a very large mosaic, which would have been, say, 10 metres by 10 metres in a large reception room in a villa. The mosaic is the size of the, size of the room. You don't build your room around the mosaic. Small ones, such as the one that was found out under the, the Bank of England, which were in much smaller square rooms, that, square, that small square room might have been just, say, four metres by four metres. Thank you. Um, Kirsten has asked, what was the proportion of, of citizens to auxiliaries in the standing army? Oh, that, that is a very good question. And uh, let me just quickly knit back into my notes where we were talking about the army in Britain. And I'm just going to revisit those figures. So in Roman Britain, military experts have estimated that there were about 50,000 troops. And of that, 35,000 were auxiliary. 15,000 were legion. So you've got twice as many auxiliary as you have legion. And that is partly a reflection of the number of citizens to non-citizens in the Roman Empire. Because early on in imperial history, certainly at the time when Britain became part of the empire, there was only a small number of people who were classified as Roman citizens and they lived on the Italian peninsula. Everyone else in the empire was considered a subject of the Roman Empire, but not a citizen of the Roman Empire. And these were the people that then became what we call the auxiliary troops. 
So they work for the same imperial authority, they're paid by the same imperial authority, but they are non-Roman heartland. They are, in modern parlance, they're non-Italian. And we've got examples of some of these uh, up on Hadrian's Wall, uh, up at Vindolanda, some of the tablets, one of which I showed you in the talk, was actually written at a time when there was a group of auxiliary soldiers based at Vindolanda who had been recruited in modern day Belgium and the Netherlands and were then stationed in Britain because the auxiliary troops were never stationed in their local area. So the, the legions uh, could be stationed across the empire, as you might imagine, but for an auxiliary troop, you would never be stationed anywhere in the empire that was near your home community. For the obvious reason that if you're policing your own people, you may have divided loyalties. So auxiliary troops, such as the little North African cavalry soldier, would have been recruited in Roman North Africa and then deployed in another part of the empire, never locally. So a lot more auxiliary than there are legionary, but legionaries tend, tend, tend to get all the um, publicity. Whenever you have reenactments, it's usually always the legions, but there would in actuality have been more auxiliary troops. That's brilliant. That was that was fantastic. Right. So thank you very much. For, that was all the questions for today. Um, I hope thank we'll you. see you all next Monday for, the, for Catherine's next talk. Until then, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Bye bye. Bye bye.